Welcome to Seeking Truth Catholic Bible Study and our series on the Gospel of Luke. You can find us at SeekingTruth.net. Please join us now for Seeking Truth with Sharon Doran. Welcome to Seeking Truth. Tonight we're discussing Luke chapter 7. It's a good chapter. Okay, I want to ask you a question. Who was pregnant first, Elizabeth or Mary? Right. And the angel said, your kinswoman, Elizabeth, in her old age has conceived a son, and this is the sixth month. So John the Baptist is six months older than Jesus. We know that. Now, 30 years later, John the Baptist will begin his ministry six months before Jesus because I, they started their ministries when they were each 30 years old. John is first. He is the forerunner. He's six months before Jesus. He's the forerunner of the Messiah. He has quite a ministry going. Disciples are coming to him. He's preaching with great conviction, full of the Holy Spirit, and his message is not easy to hear. He doesn't pull any punches. He's a very, very strong preacher. And when John saw Jesus, he knew this is what he's been preaching for. This is, he's done. He's done. All his disciples, all his ministry, this is the reason he's been preaching. John bore witness to Jesus Christ, and he cried, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, for he was before me. He who comes after me ranks before me, for he was before me. Yes, he was six months before him. But six months after him, he, he comes after him, but he ranks before him. He's, he's acknowledging the divinity of Jesus Christ right there. He knows, John knows by the power of the Holy Spirit, he knows that this is the divinity of Jesus Christ. And Elizabeth knows it. She too is full of the Holy Spirit, yet she bows before Mary. Mary she's six months along, and Mary's just got a few cells, you know, dividing and she says, why is it granted me that the mother of my Lord? She knows it is her Lord. She knows it's Jesus. She knows of the divinity inside of Mary. Why is it that my Lord would come to me? So she acknowledges the divinity of Jesus Christ. Both Elizabeth and John are filled with the Holy Spirit. That's why they have wisdom, understanding, knowledge. That's why they know. The angel Gabriel had come to Zechariah in the temple, John's father, and he said to him, your son will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from its mother's womb and your son will turn many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. And Zechariah, your son will make ready for the Lord a people prepared. That's his job, to prepare the people in advance of Messiah. He has six months to do it. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for John will go before the Lord to prepare his way. He is the forerunner to give knowledge of salvation to his people for the forgiveness of their sins to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. And guess what? Tonight in Luke 7, that's exactly where John the Baptist finds himself, sitting in a dark, dank prison cell, in darkness and in the shadow of death. It was John himself who sat there now in the shadow of death, locked up by Herod. Matthew 14 tells us that Herod had taken John and put him in prison because of Herodias, the wife of Herod's brother Philip. They were in an unlawful relationship according to Jewish law and John had told Herod it is against the law for you to have your brother's wife. <laughs> and Herod would have killed John, it says, but Herod was afraid of the people because John had quite a following. He had many disciples that were listening to his preaching and believing his Holy Spirit message. The people thought that John was one who spoke for God. The people knew the truth. They said, he's one who speaks for God. You can't hurt John. So there the greatest prophet of all time sits in a dark, dank prison cell, doubting, doubting. Did I hear this right? And in Luke 7 tonight, the disciples of John the Baptist told him of all these things. And John called to himself two of his disciples and sent them to the Lord saying this. Are you he who is to come, or shall we look for another? John wants to know, are you him? Are you the Messiah? Did he get it wrong? Does he have it right? <laughs> He's sitting in this prison wondering. And when the men had come to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, are you he who is to come, or shall we look for another? <laughs> and in that hour, in that exact hour, Jesus does something. He goes out and does many more miracles. Before he even answers John back, he cured many diseases and plagues and evil spirits. 
and many that were blind were bestowed sight in that hour. He goes out and does all these miracles. Now, why would Jesus immediately in that same hour go and do all these miracles <laughs> so that, and, and heal the sight and all these things to fulfill Isaiah 35 and so that John would know for sure this is him? Isaiah 35 says, Then shall the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man live as an horn and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. It's, it's Isaiah. It's, it's Handel's Messiah. He fulfills every single one of them. Jesus answered them, Go and tell John. Go and tell John what you have seen, what you have heard. The blind shall receive sight. The lame will walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf can hear. The dead are raised up. He did that in Nain. The poor have had good news preached to them. I am him. That's what he's saying. I am, I am, I am. Tell John. You saw it in this last hour. I just did all these things for you to be eyewitnesses so you could see and hear and go tell John. And blessed is he who takes no offense at me. So they go back and tell their master, their disciples of John, and they go back and tell him everything they'd seen and everything they'd heard. And it's him, John. It's him. It's him. How encouraging that must have been for John. His job's over. His job's done. He's the forerunner to Jesus Christ. <laughs> and when the messengers of John had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out to the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? Is that what you wanted to see? A reed shaken by the wind? Well, that's no big sight in the desert. It happens all the time. There's reeds blowing in the wind all the time in the desert. What did you go out to see? Because John is a reed that will not be shaken. John doesn't sway. His message doesn't go back and forth for itchy ears. Like St. Paul told Timothy, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but will have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own likings. John's message will not change. John is not a reed to be shaken in the world. He is firm in his conviction. He is delivering a serious message with great conviction that will not be moved or swayed or blown in the wind. Repent, you sinners! He tells it like it is. Open your hearts. The Messiah is coming. Prepare the way. <laughs> he is not a reed to be shaken by the wind. Then what did you go out to see, said Jesus? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, those who are gorgeously appareled live in luxury. They're in the king's courts. Is that what you came out to see? A guy in soft, beautiful clothes? Well, John doesn't wear a soft raiment. John wears camel hair and it's scratchy and itchy. And he doesn't usually eat much because he's almost always fasting. He's very thin. He lives a very austere life. Maybe an occasional locust here or there. Sometimes he has a little honeycomb for extra sermon energy. He lives a very austere life. He's a little out there, you know? <laughs> he lives in the desert wilderness. What did you go out there to see? Because people are coming out in droves to the desert for no reason. I mean, everything's happening at the temple. You're coming way out here for what? What did you come out to the desert to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is of he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, who shall prepare the way before thee. Oh, wow, direct fulfillment of Malachi 3. It's exactly what Malachi said. Behold, I send my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into his temple, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Isaiah also said it. Isaiah 40, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight a desert, in the desert a highway for our God. I tell you, says Jesus, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet, he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. Who's that? Who's least in the kingdom of God? There is one greater than John. <laughs> the one who's least in the kingdom of God. Who is it? Well, remember Jesus brought a lot of little children around himself. He said, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them. Don't hold them back. For to such as these belong the kingdom of heaven. Is this who he's talking about, kids? Hmm. Who's the least? Who's the very least in the kingdom of God? The humble, the meek, the lowly of God. Mary says it in her Magnificat. He has scattered the proud. 
in their imagination of their heart, he's put down the mighty from their thrones. He has exalted those of low degree. <laughs> Who's the least in the kingdom of God? The meekest one, the humblest one on the face of the entire earth. Who is God? Who, who, who would humble himself? Who, this God that would humble himself and be baptized by a man, submit to baptism by another man? Who is this God that would, would come into the, the body of a little bitty baby who needs to be burped and fed and, and diapered? <laughs> who is this humble, meek God? Who is this that's least in the kingdom of heaven <laughs> who's going to be laid in a feeding trough for beasts, bread for the world, <laughs> and go lower than that, lower than being laid in a feeding trough? He's going to put himself into a piece of bread, an inanimate object, <laughs> and he's going to dwell there in full bodily form, true presence in bread to feed the life of the world for all time. Who is this least in the kingdom of, he of heaven? Paul says it this way, have this mind among yourself, which was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not think equality with God was something to be grasped. <laughs> But he emptied himself. He took the form of a slave, a servant, a doulos, being born in the likeness of men. God of the universe takes on human form, baby flesh. And being found in human form, he humbled himself. Even more than that, he becomes obedient to death, even to death on a cross. A bloody, gory death for you and for me. <laughs> Torn to shreds, ripped to shreds. That's how humble this man, God man, is. <laughs> Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. So who is least? Who is the meekest? Who is the most humble in the kingdom of God? There is one. Jesus is the least in the kingdom of God and he's greater than John the Baptist. They're the final two witnesses of the old covenant coming into the new covenant. They're in the book of Revelation as well, chapter 13, hidden. I tell you, among those born of woman, none is greater than John. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. It's a little riddle for you. Jesus is the one greater than John. But John had to come. He had a mission. He had to announce the greatest one coming, the humblest one, the one who is greater than he. I must minimize so he can maximize. I must decrease so he can increase. My job's done. So his can continue. When they heard this, all the people and the tax collectors justified God having been baptized with the baptism of John. The sinners submitted to it. Their hearts were open. Their hearts were contrite. They went into the Jordan River, into the dirty Jordan River, and got baptized by John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by them. Uh-uh. What did you come out here to see then? <laughs> the Pharisees would go all the way out to the desert wilderness to scope out the competition. Why are all the people going out here? They're not coming to temple anywhere. They're all chasing out to the desert to see this new preacher in town. What is he saying? Who is he? What's he doing? Is he the Messiah? <laughs> They're not going to lower themselves to a baptism of repentance, especially when they have nothing to repent of because they keep the law to perfection. Why would we possibly do that? <laughs> Jesus, who is perfection, sinless, he's perfection of the Father's love, he does submit to a baptism in water in the dirty Jordan River by another man. <laughs> he had no need for it. He's the humblest. He's the meekest on the face of the earth. There is one greater than John, one more humble, one more meek. The Pharisees are offered to be washed clean from sin in the Jordan River. Come, be baptized by John. Even Naaman in the Old Testament, the Assyrian general, humbled himself, got into the dirty Jordan River even when they had better rivers in Damascus. But the Pharisees won't do it. Absolutely not. They needed no baptism. They were per perfect. And Jesus had just said on the Sermon on the Plain, blessed are you poor, yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you that hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you. And when they exclude you, and when they revile you, and cast out your name as evil on account of the Son of Man, rejoice in that day and be glad. Leap for joy and behold, your reward is great in heaven. And so their fathers did to the prophets. 
you stiff-necked people, this is Stephen, right before he dies, the first martyr, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, just like your fathers did. Which of the prophets did not your fathers persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand. (laughs) That's John the Baptist, the last one. They killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one. But John had the mission to announce this last one, this righteous one, the humblest one, the meekest one, the least in the kingdom of God, the one that was greater than he. And then Jesus tells a parable. And it's a tiny little parable. And and what a parable is, it's a little story with a great big idea. So he's talking to the Pharisees and Jesus says, to what shall I compare this men of this generation? What are they like to the Pharisees? And he says, they are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. Now, do grown men full of arrogant pride like to be called children? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We piped to you and you did not dance. We wailed to you and you did not weep. What is this? (laughs) Children in the marketplace. They want to play different games. And the biggest games in first century antiquity, the biggest events in Jewish life were funerals and weddings. They both lasted seven days. They were the big events of life. Someone dies, someone gets married. Someone dies, someone gets married. Both are to be celebrated. Two biggest events, funerals and weddings. We piped for you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not weep. Do you want to play funeral today or wedding? You know how children role play? Do you want to play funeral or wedding? We want to play wedding, we want to play wedding. We want to play funeral. We want to play funeral. We want to play wedding, we want to play funeral. Fine. (laughs) I'm leaving. I'm not playing either. That's what the Pharisees were being like. Children. Children. John the Baptist came with the funeral song, the funeral dirge. John the Baptist has come eating no bread, drinking no wine, and you say John has a demon. John played the funeral dirge. Repent! 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 The time is at hand. Repent! Turn from your sins. That's the funeral dirge. (laughs) The son of man has come eating and drinking. And you say, behold, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Jesus played a wedding march. The bridegroom of love has come to save everyone. Eat, drink. Yet wisdom is justified by all her children. (laughs) Look at the fruits of what each ministry did. That's the children. The fruit of the womb is the children. Wisdom's children are the fruits of the ministries. The wisdom of God was at work through John. He had to do his mission. He had to prepare the way. That's what God created him for. The wisdom of God was at work through Jesus, the bridegroom. Both ministries bore good fruit, the glorified God's eternal plan. Look at the fruits of what each ministry did. The fruits are wisdom's children. What type of children did they bear through their missions? Children of God. And it was all children of God, not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles as well, for all of Abraham's children, all the stars in the sky, all the sands on the seashore. Yet wisdom is vindicated by all her children, the fruits of John and the fruits of Jesus. They're both eternal fruit, whether it's a funeral dirge or a wedding dance. Both ministries were part of God's salvific plan for mankind, all humanity. Wisdom is vindicated by all her children, So John was like the best man. He prepared, got everything in order, prepared the way. Jesus was the bridegroom. John always points to Jesus, always. He must increase, I must decrease. My ministry's over. It was awesome. I had a lot of disciples. It was going great, but I'm not him. He's him. Go with him. John played a funeral dirge. Jesus plays the wedding march. Both men were needed in God's salvific plan from death into life. The wedding feast, the banquet feast of the Lamb of God. The Pharisees were behaving like spoiled children who wanted to take their ball and go home. They don't want to play anymore because they didn't get their way. No matter what tune is being played, the funeral dirge by John or the wedding march by Jesus, they're not going to participate in God's plan. So they're going to silence the funeral dirge. They're going to silence the prophet's voice and they're going to rejoice that he's dead. That's a funeral dirge they can get on board with. And they're going to silence the wedding music and crucify it on a cross. 
They don't want to hear his message either. But then it's the resurrection reprisal. Yes, wisdom is vindicated for all her children, all Adam's offspring. Like Luke takes us all the way back to Adam, universal man. <laughs> and John the Baptist will be the first one when, Haro, when Jesus harrows Hades. He's with the good thief on the cross. He says, you will see paradise with me that day. Dismas is with him. But John would have been like the first one out. You see John in all the pictures already with his halo. He's one of the first one, probably the last one down. So the first one out uh, in the icons. He's always pointing to Jesus Christ. Always pointing to Jesus Christ. In John's version, when John the Baptist sees Jesus, he says, behold, Behold, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's got all these disciples. He's baptizing down by the river, but the minute he sees Jesus coming, he says, behold the Lamb of God. (laughs) I've seen him. I've borne witness. This is the Son of God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That was his mission. That's why he came, to set sinners free. They had been waiting for God to provide a lamb since Genesis chapter 22. You know that. Just like Isaac carried the wood on his back up the same mountain range, Mount Moriah is one of Calvary's mountains. (laughs) And Isaac says to his father, Abraham, my father, here I am, son. Isaac said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb? Where's the lamb for the burnt offering? The burnt offering was a sin offering for atonement of sin. Where's the lamb? Abraham said, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering, my son. There's tension in that story because it's supposed to be Isaac. But Abraham says, God will provide a lamb. And God does provide a lamb. Because of Abraham's faith, God stops Abraham in the nick of time and says, your faith has saved you. But God will not spare his only son with the wood on his back up the same mountain range. Years later, God will provide a lamb just as promised. What Abraham found in the, in, the, in the thicket was a ram, not a lamb. <laughs> and they used the ram that time, the ram that was caught in the thicket. But God will provide a lamb one day. And it will be a lamb caught up in a thicket of thorns also. And it's Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. God will provide for himself a lamb, a burnt offering, my son. The Lord will provide. And it is said on that day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And the Lord says to Abraham, by your descendants shall all the nations of the earth bless themselves because you, Abraham, have obeyed my voice. God will provide a lamb. And see how this lamb's blood is for every continent on the face of the earth, all humanity. The sin offering, the lamb of God. Behold, behold the lamb of God. He's also the final Passover lamb with the Exodus story, but we won't go into that. But we say at Mass every time, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, grant us peace. And then the priest holds up the Eucharist. It's been transubstantiated. It's the true presence of God. And he says, behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. So every time we go to Mass, we're going to the supper of the Lamb. We'll return to Seeking Truth Catholic Bible Study with Sharon Doran in just a moment. Did you know that Discerning Hearts has a free app in which you can find all your favorite Discerning Hearts programming? Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more are found on the Discerning Hearts free app. Did you also know that you can stream Discerning Hearts programming on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and so many more. And did you know that Discerning Hearts also has the YouTube page? Be sure to check out all these different places where you can find Discerning Hearts.
Hello friends. Please take a look at SeekingTruth.net and find out how you can join as an individual online learner. Sharon's lectures are presented in a rich media format with audio, video, and an abundance of beautiful images which draw you into a deeper understanding of God's Word. In addition, part of the Seeking Truth mission is to build parish life through the communal study of God's Word. To encourage parishes to begin a Bible study, Seeking Truth offers its curriculum free of charge for parishes hosting a class. Please visit us at SeekingTruth.net where you can register to bring Seeking Truth to your own local parish. We now return to Seeking Truth Catholic Bible Study with Sharon Doran. Once for all, it's an unbloodied sacrifice. We're sacrificing the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And we say, all of us, what the centurion said tonight, we say, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, the roof of my mouth. But only say the word, and your servant will be healed. Me, thy servant, will be healed. Because that's what the Eucharist does. It heals us. That's why he came, to heal us from all the woundedness of living in this disordered world. Only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. The word of God is very, very powerful. We're seeing this all the way through Luke. His word has authority. His word has conviction. His word has power, healing power. The word of God is amazing. And we see that tonight in the healing of the centurion's servant. Now imagine that you are living by the Sea of Galilee in this time, first century. Israel is beautiful, it's quiet, it's up, away from the city. And then they come. They come. The Roman Empire is spreading throughout the land. They're coming everywhere. They're advancing. They have troops. They have trained army. They have, and Mary's sitting there mending by the Sea of Galilee. And, and, and all of a sudden, the Roman soldiers are coming into town. This is what it was like in that day. We know that from Luke 2, that in those days, a decree had gone out from Caesar Augustus. He was the very first emperor of Rome. That all the world should be enrolled. Now go 30 years later. 30 years. Jesus will be 30 now. And it's the 15th year of the second emperor of the Roman Empire, Tiberius Caesar. Pontius Pilate, a Roman prefect, has been made governor of Judea where they live. And Herod, a puppet king, an Edomite, half Jew, half Edomite, he has been made the Tetrarch of Galilee. But the first guy was Julius Caesar. And you know him from your history studies. He died in 44 BC, 44 years before Christ. On the Ides of March, on March 15th, Caesar, Julius Caesar, was assassinated. In Rome, it was a conspiracy of Roman senators led by Cassius, Decimus, and Brutus. They had concealed knives under their garments and their robes, and they assassinate Julius Caesar. And he says before he dies in that Shakespeare play, even you, Brutus, my child, even you. Julius Caesar is dead. He had named his nephew Octavius. He didn't have his own children. He had a nephew, Octavius. He gave everything, his whole will and testament to his adopted son and sole heir. Now, Octavius at the time was 18 years old. And young Octavius was advised, he got much counsel not to accept his uncle's be bequest because he was only 18. He wasn't prepared to deal with the hazards in the Roman politics and power. Any male kid who's 18 and you tell them not to do it, what are they going to do? <laughs> They're going to do it right? And so he accepts Julius Caesar's will, and he becomes the first emperor of the new Roman Empire. Octavius changes his name to Augustus, Caesar Augustus. Two years later, in 42 BC, 42 years before Christ, two years after his death, the Roman Senate declare posthumously that Julius Caesar is a god, that he is deity. <laughs> this is the fastest growing religion in the Roman Empire, the imperial cult that the, the emperors are now gods, okay? And it's the deity of men, men making themselves gods. That's way back in Genesis. We can be our own gods, right? Right at the time of his death, there's a big comet in the sky, Caesar's comet. It lasted for seven days, and everyone thought it was a sign that he really is a god. Caesar's comet. 
44 BC, the most famous comet of antiquity, seven-day visitation interpreted by the Romans as a sign of the deification of the recently assassinated Caesar, Julius Caesar. Virgil writes about it, the poet Virgil. Uh, he says, never did fearsome comets so often blaze the sky. Ovid writes about it in his Metamorphosis. He says, take up Caesar's spirit from his murdered corpse and change it into a star so that the deified Julius may always look down from his high temple on our capital and Roman forum. Shakespeare writes about it, when beggars die, they are, they're no comet seen, but when the heavens themselves declare the death of princes. Octavius is going to use this politically. The nephew, he's now Caesar Augustus, he's going to use that comet and the deification of Caesar to his own advantage politically. He will have coins minted with temple to Caesar, the god, and he'll show the comet, the star in the sky. Caesar is a, uh, Julius Caesar is a god. He'll have a temple built in Rome at the Forum, the temple of Julius Caesar, a god, called the temple of the comet, the cos, uh, comet star. It's still there to this day. You can go to the, forum it, the, the Roman Forum and see the temple of Julius. People still put flowers on the altar there. He had coins minted with the star, the comet, the comet of Caesar, Caesar is God. Julius Caesar is God. Julius Caesar is God. There's his temple. These coins sell to this day for $19,000 for one of these coins. Uh, it's history. If Julius Caesar was God, then Octavian, his son, is son of God. <laughs> This is all happening at the same time. So all the coins have God on the front and Son of God on the back. To this day, you can find these coins, God and Son of God. Now, Octavius changes his name to, to Caesar Augustus. He will rule the Roman Empire for the next 40 years. That's one biblical generation. This is right when Christ was born. Julius Caesar, in his last will, said that he wanted lots of money to go for games and entertainment, you know, like Olympic games and entertainment for the public. But Mark Anthony controlled the treasury, and he said to Octavius, to, to Caesar Augustus, no, 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 we're not going to use the money for that. He had the funds. So Octavius borrows money himself to carry out his uncle's wishes, and he makes the games happen and the entertainment, and so the public love him, and the soldiers love him. He garners much considerable support from the troops of Julius Caesar. So he's building a great army. So in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled. They're going to be counted because they want to know how much money is going to be coming in and how many projects they can do and how far they can expand and spread and how they can outfit the military and what roads they can build. And he has a great army. And this is wonderful for keeping peace because there's no one who can come up against this army. So this next hundred years is called Pax Romana, where, Oma, where Rome can keep peace because of its great military strength. And he has coins minted for that. So it's very important to keep peace, keep peace, keep peace. So not only does he call himself son of God, but he's also the prince of peace because he can keep Pax Romana. See? Are you getting this? So Augustus dramatically enlarged the empire. He expanded into Egypt. He took Africa. He took Hispania. He reformed taxation. He made networks of roads, fabulous, wonderful roads that are still intact today. You know all roads lead to Rome. Okay, and he established a great army, a Praetorian guard, police, firefighters, uh, really rebuilt and spread the empire. They had taken over from the Greeks. Remember Alexander the Great? Rome conquered the Greeks. The Greeks already had knowledge. They loved philosophy. They loved the study of wisdom. They had a lot of knowledge. They had wonderful language to explain the concepts. The Greeks did. The Romans take it over. They adopt the Greek gods, make them into Roman gods. Now they're making the emperor's gods. They make a great road system. <laughs> they have a great political system in place, a great army. And the Jews have the revealed law of God. Now, do you see those three cultures coming together is the absolute perfect storm for Christ to be born. And that's why St. Paul says in Galatians 4, when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons and daughters, all of us. So the heavens were telling the glory of God. Julius Caesar had a comet in the sky. He is a god. Look at his comet. But there was another star that appeared in the sky. 
the heavens are telling the glory of God, and it was in Bethlehem, little podunk Bethlehem, but it's under the Roman Empire. And in the days of Herod the Great, when he was king, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem saying, where is he? Where is he that's been born king of the Jews? We've seen his star. We've seen his star in the east, and we've come to worship him. And when Herod heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, and assembling all the chief priests, the scribes, all the people, he inquired, where is this Christ? Where is this Messiah supposed to be born? What do the scriptures say? What do the scriptures say? This good Jewish king didn't know the scriptures. And they told him, in Bethlehem, in Bethlehem of Judea, so it's written by the prophet. So he tells those wise men, you go and diligently search for this child, and when you have found him, come and get me. Give me word too, so I too can go worship him. Lo, the star rested over the place where he was born. They find the child. They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. They go into the house. They see the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down. These great kings from the east who have traveled far and wide, they fall down in front of this baby and worship him. They get warned, the three kings get warned in a dream not to return to Herod. So they depart by way, a different way, back to their own country. Now Caesar will rule for 40 years at this time. That's one biblical generation. And then he dies on August 19th of 14 A.D., Augustus probably died from natural causes, but some think that his, one of his wives, Livia, might have poisoned him to get her son, Tiberius Caesar, into the emperor's chair. And so, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate and Herod are ruling, and here you are in Galilee, this is your town, peaceful, quiet, and in comes Rome. A detachment has been put in your town, And you hear them coming, the ground rumbling under their feet as they march, a hundred soldiers armed with sword, shield, armor as they move down your street, moving in units, Uh, just an incredible military machine, uh, riding alongside them on a proud mount as a centurion. Distinguished in his attire, he is the leader. And he is one who has worked his way up through the ranks by merit of virtue, actually. The centurions had much virtue, and they get put into a position of authority because they're trusted. And they were in charge of, a, they're a captain of 100 men, at least 100 men, 100 foot soldiers in a legion. And they were veteran soldiers who commanded 100 men each within a legion of 6,000 soldiers, and there were 60 sentries in a legion, and each under the command of a centurion. <laughs> And during the time of Augustus Caesar, Rome had 28 legions. It's a lot of soldiers. Herod had built, had done much building. The people were being taxed by Herod because he was building everywhere. He had made palaces for himself all over Israel. Here's his Masada palace that he built 37 uh, and 31 years before Christ. He had built Caesarea Maritima, which Rome took as a headquarter because it was by the Mediterranean Sea and they could sail in and out to Italy, the co- different cohorts that were coming. Uh, and it's still there to this day, Caesarea Maritima. There's a beautiful uh, aqueduct there. There's a Roman amphitheater. There's a Greek hippodrome where they could do chariot races. It's all still intact. Um, but this is where a lot of the soldiers were headquartered. Centurions are mentioned often in the New Testament. I I counted 24 times mentions of different centurion soldiers. Uh, A common soldier was paid between 200 and 300 denarii per year. That's not very much. Roman soldiers would come from Rome to Jerusalem, especially at crowded times like Passover. Why? To keep Pax Romana, to keep peace, because these Jews have these feasts, and they're going to come from all over the diaspora, and there's going to be, there could be rioting, there could be this, there could be that. We have to be there with guards. To ensure Pax Romana and crowd uprisings, there were always soldiers dispatched ordering uh, a common execution was crucifixion by Rome, by the empire, and for those who dare challenge Rome, there were always soldiers uh, outside the city gates and many crucifixions going on. It was their form of capital punishment. So we see Jesus had to march with Roman soldiers. Uh, many times we see in the scourging and different scenes. But at the cross, there is a centurion who is keeping watch over Jesus. He saw the earthquake And he was filled with awe, and he said, truly, truly, this was the Son of God. Many of the pagan centurions, men of virtues, became God-fearers, and they became believers. The centurion uh, in Luke's gospel saw what had taken place. He praised God, and he said, certainly, this man was innocent. 
And Pilate, wondering if Jesus was dead already, summoned a centurion and asked him, is he dead? And when Pilate learned from the centurion that Jesus was dead, he gave the body to Joseph of Arimathea. Pilate approved for a guard of Roman soldiers to be at the tomb of Jesus Christ because they said, you know what they said, they're going to steal his body. We got to get that guarded. So he let a, a, a crew of soldiers guard the tomb. And uh, Matthew has the same story that we see tonight. Matthew 8 is the healing of the centurion slave. And you know, the first Gentile Christian was a centurion. In Acts chapter 10, it was Cornelius. And Peter is sent to him, and he and his whole household get baptized. So the first Gentile baptized Christian, a pagan Roman centurion soldier who became a God-fearer, who became a Christian, and his whole household. Centurions receive more pay than soldiers, 20 times more than ordinary soldiers, 5,000 denarii a year. And five senior centurions in a legion got 10,000 denarii a year. And the chief centurion that had the head javelin, he got 20,000 denarius a year. That's why he could help build the synagogue in Capernaum. He was well paid. He had a lot of money. So let's see what it says in Luke 7. Jesus ended all of his sayings in the hearing of the people, and he entered Capernaum. You know Capernaum is on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. It's a fishing town. It's where Peter lived. He had healed Peter's mother-in-law there. Uh, the name literally means Nahum's village. It had a population of whopping 1,500 people lived there, and you can still see the ruins of the Roman period. Uh, there is a Catholic church built over St. Peter's house, and there's that synagogue that the centurion helped build. There's been two. There was one before this one. That would have been the one he helped with, the first century one. This is a fourth century one, stands in the same spot. It's built over the other one. There is a centurion. He had a slave who was very dear to him. So he's a man of virtue. He loves his slave. He loves his servant. He loves those who work in his household. He was sick and to the point of death. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews asking him to come and heal his slave. He will send Jews. He doesn't want Jesus to get in trouble. If he's with a pagan centurion, he's going to be unclean. He, he sends Jews to go talk to him. And, and they come to Jesus, and they besought him earnestly. And they say, he's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy, Jesus. He's worthy. He's worthy to have you do this for him because he loves our nation. He loves Israel. And he helped build our synagogue in our town. He's a good one. He's a good one. And Jesus went with them. He accompanies them back. He doesn't care if he's going to be unclean. He, he, and when they're not far from the house, the centurion sends friends saying, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. What a contrast. They're saying, he's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy. And he's saying, I'm not worthy. That's humility. <laughs> Therefore, I didn't presume to come to you. I didn't make that presumption. But you just say the word. Say the word and let my servant be healed. <laughs> the word, the word of Jesus Christ is so powerful. They're starting to understand this. The authority and the power and the conviction of his word. You don't even have to come. Just say the word. That's all you have to do. The centurion gets that. He might have heard of how when Jesus drew out the leper, they, they, Jesus commanded with his word the leper to leave the man's body, and he has to because the authority of his word. The, 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 the demon has no choice but to leave. They have to obey. The authority of his word is so great that the demons must leave the body of the possessed. <laughs> and this soldier, this centurion, he gets authority. He understands the chain of command. He says, I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes. I say, come, and he comes. <laughs> or or so their heads fall, right? He knows authority. And to my slave, do this. And he does it. <laughs> and when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him. And he turned and said to the multitude that was following him, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith as this centurion man, this pagan soldier from Rome. He gets it. He understands the authority of my word. He's humble. He has virtue. He cares for, for this dying man who, who's way beneath him, a slave. And this is what we say at Mass every time now. <laughs> and when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave well. Lord, do not trouble yourself. I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and thy servant will be healed. 
That's what we say when we go up for healing in the power of the Eucharist. I'm not worthy that you would come inside my body to dwell into this temple on the roof of my mouth. You're, I, I, I'm not worthy. <laughs> but only say the word and my soul will be healed. That's what the Eucharist does. Eucharist after Eucharist after Eucharist after Eucharist after Eucharist. You're healed and you're healed more and you're healed deeper and you're healed deeper and you're healed deeper. When you go forth for Eucharist, ask for that healing. Be open to the power of that healing, to that word. Only say the word and my soul will be healed. That's a Gentile centurion. No greater faith in all of Israel. Now, what other miracle happened in this chapter? Only Luke tells this miracle, and it's a biggie. It's a resurrection. It doesn't get any bigger than that. No one else tells about the widow of Nain and her son. <laughs> no one, not Matthew, not Mark, not John. How many Old Testament resurrections are there? This is as big as it gets. How many Old Testament resurrections? Three. Three, the divine number, the number of the Trinity. The widow at Zarephath's son, the Shumanite woman's son, and then a man gets tossed into Elisha's tomb and he springs back to life. Jesus is at the town gate with another widow in despair. This is exactly what we heard about a few weeks ago. The widow in despair at the town gate. It was the widow at Zarephath. Remember, she was collecting sticks for their last meal. She just had a little flour and a little oil. That's it. They're going to die. It's a famine. Three and a half year famine. This man of God comes. She's Zarephath. She's not even their prophet. And he, and he wants her last meal. And God inspires her to say yes and gives her faith. She, he is going to resurrect her son eventually because her son dies and she's a widow and it's her only son. And Elijah's going to resurrect the widow's son. And Elijah, Elijah's going to give the son, the only son, back into the arms of his widowed mother. The second Old Testament resurrection is Elisha. Remember, Elisha was the one who wanted a double portion of Elijah's spirit when he went up in the fiery chariot. Throw me down your mail. I want a double portion of your spirit. <laughs> so Elijah got one resurrection, but Elisha is going to get two resurrections, a double portion. <laughs> as big as it gets, miracle. He wanted a double portion. He'll do two resurrections. The first one, twice as many as Elijah. The first one is on the Shumanite woman's son. Elijah came into the house, the kid's lying dead on the bed. He shuts the door, he goes in, he prays to the Lord. He lays upon the child, puts mouth upon mouth, eyes upon eyes, hands upon hands like a cruciform cross. Stretches out his body upon his and the flesh of this child starts to become warm again. He got up, walked around, walked to and fro, went and stretched himself upon him. The child sneezed seven times. <laughs> a perfection of sneezes. And the child opens his eyes. It's resurrection number two of Elisha. The third resurrection is in 2 Kings 13. Once some Israelites were burying a man and they saw a band of raiders, a grave robbers coming. So they quickly threw the man into the tomb of Elisha onto his body. And when it touched Elisha's bones, the man sprang to life and stood up on his feet. This is a great miracle of Elisha the prophet, the one with the double portion of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ this is the typology. Elisha is, Elijah is the typology for John the Baptist. Elisha is the typology for Jesus Christ. How much Holy Spirit does Jesus Christ have? Elisha has a double portion. Jesus Christ has all the Holy Spirit, undivided unity in his divinity. He has a full portion. Remember in Luke's gospel, the Holy Spirit comes on him in bodily form and stays on him. That's how John knows. In John's gospel, John says, the one the Holy Spirit comes on and stays on, that's the one. That's Messiah. God tells him that. And so Jesus Christ has a full portion of the Holy Spirit. In his divine nature, he has the full trinity. Undivided unity. And, and how many resurrections did Jesus do? Infinity Holy Spirit, and he does infinity resurrections because you're going to rise from the dead. Everyone in here is going to rise from the dead one day. We say it in the Nicene Creed every Sunday. I look forward to the resurrection of the dead. He's going to rise everybody for final judgment. Are you going to go up or are you going to go down? <laughs> You're going somewhere. You're going to be risen. So it's really cool. They're, they're in Nain. That's really close. It's only five miles from Nazareth. Nazareth is Jesus' hometown. That's where Mary lives. That's where Joseph lived. That's where the carpentry shop was. It's right there. 
And he was with a great crowd. It's just five miles south of Nazareth. That's Mary's hometown. And who's the only writer that has Mary's story? Luke. And who's the only one who puts this resurrection five miles from Nazareth in his book? Luke. Who do you think told him this story? Yeah, I would guess. No one else knows it because you'd include a resurrection. Here's Nazareth, there's Nain, and it's only two miles from the Shumanite woman's resurrection. This is resurrection territory here. (laughs) Jesus drew near to the gate at the city of Nain, and behold, a man who had died. He's being carried out. He's the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. I'm always so moved by that because it means to be moved with pity. He sees this woman is her only son. Her only son is dead. This is destitution for the widow. She doesn't inherit the land. Women don't inherit the land. The tribes inherit the land. The men inherit the land. The next of kin brother inherits the land, not the wife. So a woman who has an only son that dies is destitute. She can glean in the fields. She can beg. And he has compassion on her. This is so close to Nazareth. I think he's thinking of his own mom when he dies soon. And he's her only son, and this is what my mom's going to be like. And he says to her, do not weep. And he came and he touched the buyer, and the bearer stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, it's just with his word, I say to you, arise. The power of his word and the dead man sat up and began to speak. Can you imagine being there that day? (laughs) And Jesus gave him to his mother. This is exactly what Elijah did. He gave the resurrected son back to the widow. Blessed are you who weep now for one day. You will laugh. He had just preached that. Fear seized them all. They glorified God, saying, A great prophet, a great prophet has arisen among us today, here in Nain. Podunk, Nain. No one even knows about it. God has visited his people here in Nain. Maybe this is what Moses meant when the Lord told Moses in Deuteronomy 18, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all I command him. They're waiting for a prophet from their own. The report came concerning him through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. Only Luke has his miraculous resurrection in Nain. (laughs) Only Luke has Mary's story. And this is so close to home, so close to home for Jesus in so many ways. And this scene foreshadows his own mother, what she will face one day soon. And maybe Mary told Luke the story. (laughs) And Mary, too, is going to be a widow. We know she was probably a widow at the cross because Joseph wasn't there. And if Joseph was alive, he would have been there with her. But Mary is also widow Israel because she's the hinge pin between the two covenants. She's a daughter of Zion, and she's a daughter of the new covenant. She's a mother of the church. She's both. She might remember the widow at Nain (laughs) and the resurrection of her only son, and it might give her hope in the darkest moment of her life. Hope that maybe he will rise, like he said, on the third day. Now the church uses this story, the widow of Nain, this obscure story only in Luke on St. Monica's feast day. Did you know that? Who loves St. Monica? Who has wayward sons? Who's praying to Monica for intercession? This is, the ch- this is what they use at Mass. Because this son was dead. And then he's raised. And he's given new life in Christ just like our sons could be. And this is why the church in her great wisdom uses this for this feast day of St. Monica, giving hope, uh, the mother Monica, hope for her dead son, spiritually dead son, Augustine. And both became great Catholic saints. Augustine was forgiven much. He was naughty, 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 naughty. (laughs) Give me salvation, just not yet. He was forgiven so much so he could love so much. And that's the last story we see tonight, our final vignette. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him at his house. And so he went into the home of the Pharisee's house and sat at table. This Pharisee's name was Simon. Behold, a woman of the city entered who was a sinner. And she learned uh, that he was sitting at table in the Pharisee's house and she brought an alabaster flask of ointment and standing behind him at his feet weeping, 
This alabaster ointment, once you open it, it can't be resealed. It's extremely expensive. She began to wet his feet with her tears. <laughs> she wiped them with her hair. She kissed his feet. She didn't say a word. She anointed his feet with the ointment. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, now he's just thinking to himself. He said to himself, he didn't say this out loud. He's just thinking this. He said to himself, if this man, Jesus, is such a prophet, he would have known who that sort of woman is that's touching him. She's a sinner. He didn't say it. He thought it. Now, why did Jesus come? Simeon told Mary that Jesus came so that the thoughts out of many hearts may be revealed. Jesus can read hearts, and he knows what Simon is thinking. And Jesus answered Simon, saying, Simon, I have something to say to you. And Simon answered, what is it, teacher? A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other owed 50. When they could not pay, he forgave them both. Now, which one of them would love him more? Okay, you owe $500 or $50, you get released of 500 Oh, hey! Simon answered, the one I suppose who he forgave more. And Jesus said, you have judged rightly. Then he turned toward the woman, and he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water to wash my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears. She has wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. And this is a very intimate scene. This woman loves Jesus. She is pouring out her tears. She is pouring out her love. She is lavishing him extravagantly with her most expensive, probably her bridal ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, because he can read hearts, her sins, which are many, are forgiven because she has loved much. <laughs> She's the 500. But he who is forgiven little loves little. Simon, you're stingy with your love. You did nothing for me. You're no host. <laughs> and he said, to her, you're, he said to her, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> Redeemed sinners have the grace needed to love well. If you have sinned greatly in your life, maybe you've done something you're so ashamed of way back when and you don't even want to think about it and you can't even think about it. Redeemed sinners who have known God's grace can love really, 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 really well. Anybody in here a sinner? Because <laughs> you love well. Think of the love in this room that's possible because we've been forgiven of so much, so much that we're ashamed of. He doesn't want us condemned. He wants us saved. The evil one wants to condemn you. Once you've confessed your sin in confession and the priest absolves you, you're forgiven. You can go and sin no more. You have so much love. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more, love abounds all the more. You know the mercy of God. You can give that away. Redeemed sinners have grace needed to love lavishly. Redeemed sinners have grace needed to love extravagantly. <laughs> then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this? Who is this who even forgives sins? When they put the paralytic man through, he dropped in, and Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Well, only God can forgive sins. Now he's forgiving her sin. Only God can forgive sin. Only God can. Is this him? Is this Messiah? Do you think this is him? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. He or she who is forgiven much can love much. Glory to God. Now, would you like to have been there? Would you like to be that woman? Would you like to have dinner with Jesus? Well, you can. Every time you go to Mass, you have dinner with Jesus. He's the main course. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world so that you can love much. And we say, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof into my temple, but only say the word and your servant will be healed. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we praise and thank you. We thank you for your forgiveness so that we can lavish love on others. Help us not be stingy with our love. You, Lord, have forgiven me of so much in my life. 
And, and anyone else who wants to join this prayer, just help us to love now. And to, since we've known your mercy so greatly, help that mercy and grace and love just abound out of us to our families, uh, to our neighbors, to strangers, to enemies, to anyone you put in our path, Lord. Thank you for forgiving our sins and thank you for your abundance, your extravagance of love. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for joining us for Seeking Truth Catholic Bible Study. For more information, please go to seekingtruth.net.